Yeah, we're ready? Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's Michelle Staples, Duncan Mayer, and I am so excited um, this morning to be here to welcome a dear friend of mine, Hoyamton. He has traveled all over the world learning from different Indigenous cultures, and he brings back everything that he learns and he shares it with his community in Quetzin um, and with, with all of us. He's incredible at building connections between communities, uh, between cultures, and he's a, a, just an amazing human being that I am so uh, proud to call my friend. And he, his property, if you ever have a chance to come and visit what he does, 80% of his entire built structures on his property where he gets to teach people about culture are built from recycled materials. And uh, I am just honored to welcome you to open the day. I was lovely using our language to do introductions. When I travel to different countries, when I speak our language, one of the one places I was teaching in Europe in um, Berlin, and I was teaching a class of 480 students, grade 12. And when I spoke my language, a lot of the students were giggling and laughing. And I, I sort of looked at them and I asked one of the students, I said, why do you laugh? And they got really nervous. And one of the students, he was brave enough, he said, I don't understand and I just have to laugh because I don't understand what you're saying. So when we think about that experience of who we are, where we've come from, well, in the end, it was wonderful because I could share with that student, das ist alles gut, ja, das ist just die Indiana, alles gut für die Kinder, es ist cool, ja. So it really surprised them because that, wow, they said, wow, you can, communicate in our language. So when we think about humanity, you know, the way I look at it, you know, the way I learned from a lot of our Salkwe and our elders is <clears throat> a lot of us have a energy that is relative to the environment around us. Language is one of them. Think about when you talk to people. If you can speak to somebody in their dialect, their whole DNA changes because now they find that comfort in that relationship. You know, so when we start to look at <clears throat> the climate, the environment, and all the things around us, you'll hear a lot of times people will refer to a, a, a quote, they'll say, all my relations. I don't know if any of you have heard that you know, sort of reference. And I always ask people, what does all my relations mean? Because the way we understood it from our elders, the upbringing we've come to know is that we as human beings are the very last of the evolution. The two leggeds are the last of the evolution. So the way our grandparents and great grandparents, if you were lucky enough to learn from them, they would say that <clears throat> everything is our relation. And we're just a part of that whole cycle. So when I start to look at <clears throat> the devastations of society, <clears throat> our, our, our environment globally, even locally here now with uh, so much of uh, the resource extraction, it may, makes me really wonder what kind of relationship <clears throat> do the people doing that work have and what do they understand? Because a lot of the things I look at is, again, what is your relationship to everything around you? So when I, I listen to a lot of different uh, webinars and talks, and this is so weird, this um, whole Zoom thing, you know, it's so strange because I'm, I, I'm what we call experiential learners. So if I'm trying to teach, 
uh, students about ethnobotany and I have a plant. Um, one second, I take a plant like this and say, can you smell that? Here, can you smell it? Here, can you take some of that? And can you taste it? Can you listen to it? Because when we learn, we have five senses. And if we're in this relationship, or maybe using two, we see things and hear things, but you can't touch this. You can't feel this. You know, so we're, we're getting in that reductionist experience. So when I think about this, this relationship to climate, you know, a lot of our elders, they, they were scientists. They were ethnobotanists. They were anthropologists, but they didn't have the label. A lot of people say they didn't have the education, but then I think you got a degree of a doctorate from one of our elders information. So why doesn't our elder have a doctorate? So I always question those things and it makes me think about, again, how much our elders would share with us when we we're younger. They say, sometimes it, it's taken 40 years to make sense to me. One of the things the elder used to always say with and tell me, and he would tell us like a lot of the stuff we learned was in our language before they, they take taken our language away from us. We got stuck in that, that big dysfunction of the sixties. But I remember, and it took me probably 45 years to really connect to what my elder was saying, because he would always teach us about everything in every direction, four directions. But he said, in your time, your teacher is going to become very small. And I never understood this. And when technology really started coming strong, it started to really make sense to me. This is our teacher. I always go to a school and say, who has one? Four directions. And we believe everything that comes from this. We have a word in our language, telekalopathosis. Um, my Shkomnik would say that's a language interrupter. So with these things that we look at, you know, when I'm teaching students, I always say that really, what do we know? Especially in our technological world, one of the things I always um, help students to really think about, you know, when they look at it is Grandma Google and Grandpa Yahoo only know what people tell them. And is it true? So it makes students think about things, makes them look at things differently. It's like our science, you know, our science is very narrow. You know, our, the elders would always tell the people, if you cut all these trees up in the headwaters, it's going to affect our river and our ocean. And the scientists all said, oh, no, it'll grow back. Oh, it will be all right. And we look at our waterways now, we look at our oceans now, is it all right? And you're still cutting, you're still destroying. And you're putting a monoculture in that will never regenerate the flora and fauna that was there for thousands of years. So one of the things I look at, um, I'm going to leave this little piece with you. you know, they, they say that, uh, again, when we prepare for our, our future in our Hulkaminum language, they, we refer to it as tashenam, to prepare for a uh, future, to look at the future. Or if we look at what we're doing here today, it's a wattle, working together, you know, to look at what can be changed. So one of the things I'll leave with your conference is, <clears throat> and I referred to this years ago when I was working with uh, students, and I started to see a lot of the impacts of the environment around us, and I would always hear this reference. What 
kind of earth are we leaving for our children? And I thought about it and I thought, that's not really true. It's what kind of children are we leaving for this earth? So that's the thing I, I leave with a lot of groups because when we start to think about where we're at and who's making the decisions and how destructive some of those decisions are, if we have children that understand that and break that cycle and become the decision makers for some of those companies or corporations, you know, they'll look at it differently. And I think that's the only way that we're going to really start to um, become what we call uh, a wattle. Now it's the only way we're gonna become that working body together. So from the beautiful Cowichan Valley, from our traditional territory of the Quetzal Salchwain, our traditional elders, you know, I leave these few words with you and I'm grateful for each and every one of you that will come forward to share your teachings, to share your knowledge, because we, in this time, in this era we're in, you know, we need a lot of people that really think clearly about what is going to be the remainder of our environment we live in. Because at this point in time, we see so much that is um, being destroyed and taken and never will ever come back. You know, I don't care how many times the scientists say it'll come back. No, it won't. It will be something that will come back, but not what it originally was. So in our language, we always put our hands up. We say, I tape the in the CMCIs. Because the way that our elder would explain it to me is when you put your hand up, you're taking everything in. And I'm grateful for this opportunity. And I thank so much my wonderful relation, Michelle, for um, asking to come and share this, this beautiful day. And when we first started, we all were sort of a mono connection of Alex. So I thank Alex for making us all who she is for that short period of time, because we'll all learn so much more. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. I'm going to stay on as long as I can. Uh, we all raise our hands um, to you. Thank you I so see. much. Um, and thank you to Michelle um, and Hampton. That was so beautiful. And we're so grateful that you could join us today. I am Megan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a counselor in the colonially named District of North Vancouver, um, which is on Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil um, unceded, unsurrendered territory. And I am constantly learning from um, people in the community who um, put my years of environmentalism um, to thousands of years of environmentalism. And so I'm humbled and grateful and learning um, every day. I wanted to um, acknowledge the um, ongoing violence um, and destruction that's happening in Iqaluit. Um, currently, Wet'suwet'en, Lillooet, um, who is without homes right now from the horrible fire um, this summer. And, and just to acknowledge that as we sit here today, there's a lot of violence happening around us. Um, and the only thing that will bring us through is love. So while it is seemingly controversial in politics to talk about public policy in, in the realm of love, I think we need to do a lot more of that. So I hope um, today we um, can sort of take that time to, to reflect on, on the words that Wampton um, gifted us with. And I, wanted to uh, give a shout out to the Climate Caucus's amazing staff. Um, so Judy and Alex and Olivia and Magnolia, um, none of this happens without you. Uh, and also to our board that are all volunteers and um, of course, all of our members and allies, just a shout out to all of you because that's what Climate Caucus is. It's a 
It's a collective of, of folks um, working towards climate justice together. Um, so on that note, Alex, uh, who I just fondly remember met at the first summit, this is our third summit. It seems like it was about, I don't know, 57 years ago, but it was three years ago, a lot has changed. Do you remember everyone, whoever was there? Um, it was, uh, we, we started, uh, I think I made Alex run around because we had to do no plastics, vegan food. <laughs> I can remember being like, oh my God, who is this Megan? Um, and three years later, I it has just been such a pleasure to get to work together and to really continue our journey from starting from a place of looking at climate as a technological issue and a, and a issue that we're gonna solve through science um, to really getting to the root of it, which is about power. Um, and I think that uh, through her law degree um, and her master's um, in, in really what emerged from that is like, it's, this is all about power. It's about who has it, how they use it. Um, and so I think that uh, we're really, really grateful for all of Alex's work in both bringing the summit together and bringing Climate Caucus um, together and along. And so I'm really excited today to announce that Alex is now, even though we're not too into titles, I was really reflecting on what, <laughs> um, on what you said about titles, um, but we'll, she is the executive director of Climate Caucus now. And so as much as we're non-hierarchical, um, it is important to give her uh, the, the props for, for that um, leadership. Um, that she's shown, but also the humility to know that we're not leading, um, we're following the lead of um, indigenous land um, protectors and water defenders. Um, and I might've gotten that uh, uh, um, backwards, but uh, both, right? Uh, land protectors and uh, or water protectors and land defenders, but it's both. Um, so I'm, I, one of my favorite climate um, writers is Mary Anais Hegler, and I will put her um, name in the chat um, because she's an amazing uh, writer and I am going to open the day um, and then pass it back over to Alex who's going to talk about sort of the nuts and bolts of what we're getting into today um, with an excerpt from an essay that she wrote um, to start our to, to start us off let's see not really start us off but continue us so there are many different schools of thought about how we should feel about climate change. For decades, the dominant narrative has been that we should feel guilt. Then there's the dual narrative that calls for hope. Others have called for fear or panic. I myself am on the record calling for anger, but I don't always feel angry to tell the truth. In fact, sometimes I'm hopeful, sometimes I'm scared, sometimes I'm overwhelmed, and sometimes I'm downright stubborn. That's because none of these emotions really get to the heart of what I truly feel. None of them are big enough if I'm being honest. What I truly feel is love. I don't mean any simple, sappy kind of love. I don't mean anything cute or tame. I mean living, breathing, heart beating love, wild love. This love is not a noun, she is an action verb. She can shoot stars into the sky, she can spark a movement, she can sustain a revolution. I love this beautiful, mysterious, complicated planet we get to call home. The planet who had the audacity to burst with life from her boreal crown to her icy toes at the South Pole, I love her caves and her valleys and her rivers and her oceans. I love the majesty of larger than life elephants and whales and rhinos and lions. I love the unapolog unapologetic sass of butterflies and hummingbirds and coral reefs and the tear jerking aroma of flowers that bloom below the equator. And I love my mama and I love my family. When you love something or someone that much, of course you're frightened when you see it under attack. And of course you're furious at anyone or anything that would dare harm it. But this love is strong enough to break through terror. She is hot enough to burn through anger and turn into fury. She can shake you out of your despair and propel you to the front of the battlefield. It's a love that can also, even in the teeth of the most insurmountable odds, give me hope if I'm brave enough to accept it. I've, been, I've seen her looking back at me in the eyes of some of the bravest climate justice warriors I have ever met. And I can feel that tickling tingle of maybe, just maybe, we'll be okay. A love like that doesn't seek peace or even vengeance. She seeks justice. And she's strong enough, ferocious enough, brave enough to burn this bitch to the ground. <laughs> so on that note, I pass it over to Alex. Geez, I felt like chanting through that one. <laughs> Thank you. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, and I do just want to say a quick thank you to everybody in this organization. It's been such a pleasure to work with everyone and uh, and I absolutely love it. Like my whole heart is in this organization. So um, thank you to everyone who makes it so wonderful every day. Um, just quickly, I'll just introduce myself and then we'll go straight into the first panel. And then if everyone just wants to stay on um, at the end of the panel, I will do some housekeeping bits to explain the whole day. I know it's a little confusing, but if you all bear with me, we will get through this together um, and it's going to be amazing. So my name is Alex Lidstone. My pronouns are she, her. If you're comfortable, we do encourage attendees to include their pronouns in their names, but don't feel like you have to. Um, I am calling in from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina First Nations, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, as well as all other people who make their homes on the Treaty 7 region region of Southern Alberta. Um, so we're going to go right into our first panel. I'm super excited for it. Um, so I can introduce our moderator, Chi Ying Ho. Um, Chi Ying is the executive director of the WCS Engagement and Planning. Um, she has over 20 years of experience in community planning, engagement, and, and sustainability, and she is a seasoned facilitator. She provides strategy, creative process, design, and engagement for local governments, private sector clients, and nonprofit organizations. She develops and executes innovative community development focused programs to support community goals and works with multi interdisciplinary teams to deliver project desired outcomes. Um, she has worked with us throughout our entire lifetime here at Climate Caucus, and she's helped on many, many things. So we're super excited to have her here again um, to facilitate this panel. And with that, I will pass it along. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. And these webinars are a bit weird because I can't see anyone except me. And, and we're all so serious on Zoom. So I thought I'd put a little, uh, since I'm moderator, I guess I get to do things. So I put a little, um, head ornament on for today. Anyway, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first plenary of this year's Climate Caucus Summit. As Alex said, my name is Chi Ying Ho. I'm with WCS Engagement and Planning, and I'm joining you today from the unceded traditional territories of the Skohomish and Liwat nations. This session is focusing on system change in local government, which is a teeny easy topic to tackle, right? We're going to discuss climate change, the ecological crisis and social justice and how they are all inextricably linked. This panel that we have today will explore these complex problems and day-to-day -day challenges of local government through the concept of donut economics and system change. So this will be a panel presentation followed by questions and answers. You'll notice, I see the chat's been going very actively, but for questions, if you could use the Q&A function in the Zoom for questions, and I will try to get them addressed throughout, um, either uh, through our panelists or responses on the Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the panel um, presentations, but we will answer them verbally after all three panelists have presented. So I'll quickly introduce all three panelists first, and then they'll speak in the order in which they were introduced. So panelists, if you could show yourselves, reveal yourselves, there, there we go. So first, Dr. Andrew Fanning, he was waving already from the real deal. Um, Andrew is data analysis and research lead at the Donut Economics Action Lab. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to work for that, hey? <laughs> uh, abbreviated deal. And he is a visiting research fellow in the, in the Sustainability Research Institute at the University of Leeds. He is interested in ways to translate the global donut to smaller scales. So does that mean Timbits? <laughs> <laughs> um, from neighborhood to nation and beyond. His research in the field of ecological economics aims to identify the changes needed to maintain or enhance human well being in a world where the environmental pressures of economic activity are kept within local and planetary boundaries. And then we have Tyler. Hey, Tyler. Tyler Brown is a counselor with the city of Nanaimo, and he's the chair of the regional district of Nanaimo. He has a background in community planning, intergovernmental relations, and policy development for local government. He is passionate about reforming government to better respond to the social, environmental, and economic challenges of our time. You've got your work cut out for you. 
And third, sort of my neighbor, Alexandra, who is also based in Whistler. Alexandra Kanitz is the co-founder and CEO of Nexial. She has a long career in international business and now 25 years working with systems thinking and change. She combines strategic thinking with a drive to make change happen on the ground. In the past 15 years, she has maintained a strong focus on sustainability, and she's currently working with UN high-level champions for the Race to Zero Decarbonization Initiatives and New Economics Thinking with European Foundations, including support to projects being presented at COP26 workshops in a few weeks. So thank you, all three of you, for joining us. Um, Alex, do we have a poll ready to go? Quick poll. Thirty more seconds. Okay. Well, this is this is good. Um, four out of the participant or four of the participants in the audience say you use donut economics to inform my thinking and work. I don't, I don't know if that includes Tyler as one of the four because we know he does. Okay, um, a bunch of you have a good theoretical knowledge. That's great. And a ton of you say you've heard of the term. That's fantastic. Um, some of you haven't heard of donut economics but you like donuts. So Andrew, that's a good start, right? And then some people say I've never heard of the term and you don't even like donuts, okay. Well, thanks for that. And now that we've got that out of the way, let's go to Andrew to start us off. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much. And thank you. I'm just, I'm just really glad to be a part of this. Thanks for the, the, you know, the invitation, the starting words, everything's been great so far and I couldn't be happier to join you all at this Climate Caucus Summit. So I'm currently living in Europe, but I was born in Halifax and so I'd like to begin by recognizing that my city is in Mi'kmaq, uh, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I'd like to acknowledge them as the past, present and future caretakers of the land of my birth. Now, I'm a small, a part of a small team at Donut Economics Action Lab or DEAL, which was founded in 2019 by my colleagues, Kate Rayworth, who wrote the book. Uh, literally, and Carlota Sant. And really the aim of our work is to turn donut economics from a radical idea in a book into transformative action. Uh, it's kind of the name on the tin. So we see ourselves as part of a much bigger movement of inspiring organizations and change makers, and I love the term just of relations, who are working at many scales towards the shared goal of a world in balance, you know, that meets the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. So again, couldn't be more pleased to be with you here at the Climate Caucus uh, as your summit because it's just such a such a big part of that. So I have prepared some slides. So let me share my screen. It's the moment of truth to see if it all works. Can you see the screen? Can you give a thumbs up? Yep, great. Then for us, a deal, the starting point really is to, to recognize that the 21st century, it's begun with multiple global crises from the financial meltdown in 2008 to the era of climate and ecological breakdown that we are enduring. And now nearly two years into COVID lockdown or a global pandemic. And the impacts of these crises are heightened by inequalities of age, of race, of gender and wealth. And together, the crises are just repeatedly telling us that we are globally connected and interdependent with each other as well as the living world and that these shocks there we're experiencing them they largely arise out of the very systems that we have inherited from the 20th century and these 20th century shock systems have been they've been created to expect and to depend upon 
just endless expansion. So we get endless expansion in finance and we get a subprime mortgage bubble that pops. We end this expansion in economic activity fueled by fossil fuels and we break down the stability of our climate or end this expansion of just humanity into the few remaining untouched areas uh, of, our, of our living planet coupled with just nonstop global air travel and we create all the conditions needed for a global health pandemic. So we need to just reimagine what it means to achieve human prosperity in the 21st century with a vision that doesn't include this endless expansion everywhere. And so we offer a donut created by Kate Rayworth. It points towards this goal that I mentioned, meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet, where no one should be in the hole, falling short on the, the essentials of life, like the social foundation, which is made up of 12 social priorities drawn from the sustainable development goals, like food, or water, or political voice, etc. So we need to get everyone above this social foundation and into the green ring of the donut, but simultaneously we can't overshoot the ecological ceiling made up of the nine planetary boundaries that earth system scientists say uh, maintain the stability of the earth system, because that oh, clearly can destabilize the earth system. So if the aim is to live within this donut's green ring, then suddenly, and this expansion is no longer the goal, it's balance, it's thriving. Uh, and yes, so if that is our aim though, right now humanity as a whole is far from achieving it. So billions of people still can't meet their most basic human needs. And they live in cities and nations, both rich and poor. But simultaneously and collectively, we're already overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. So we need economies that bring us into the donut from both sides at the same time. And that has, it just has not been tried before because the systems we've inherited weren't designed to deal with that challenge. It's our challenge. And we need to invent new systems and new policies to face it. So that's the question, I guess, but how, of course, what would it mean to translate this global concept of the donut down to smaller scales like Timbits or like the cities and regions where the where the 400 plus local elected leaders of the climate caucus actually make policies? How do we consider the locally relevant context and history that makes each place unique without losing sight of the bigger picture? And that's a question we've been exploring with cities. And we've developed a framework that you can almost think, I'm going to phrase it here in terms of cities, but you can think, please, I invite you to think it about towns or regions or, or wherever you may be. And ask the question, can our city live within the, within the donut? And we almost think about it as unrolling it. And if we do unroll the donut, then it frees up space to envision a safe and just future here, wherever here happens to be, that doesn't lose track of that of our global responsibilities with the rest. And it's based on a core question that I invite you to consider here for your city or place, wherever that may be, which is how can our city become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the health of all people, the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? There's a question to me almost of whether well-being and health can be the same in some ways, but anyway, I digress. And wrapped up in there are four fundamental questions. So within each of those questions, actually, we have identified a set of, of almost ways to, to find entry points, because really this is a tool for transformative action. It's not an academic exercise. Um, so we want to be able to identify entry points and also identify dimensions that can each hold like locally relevant metrics. So first, how can all the people of our city thrive? What does thriving mean to people here in this place and what are their aspirations for food or health or education, mobility, social, social equity, political voice and more. And second, how can our city aim to be as generous as the wildland next door, recognizing that each place is a point on this planet. So where is it? What biome is it in? What ecosystem is it, is it in? How do healthy ecosystems nearby cleanse the air or sequester carbon or store groundwater, house biodiversity. And likewise, what if the city could aspire to match or exceed that healthy ecosystem's functioning? 
So these two questions set out the local aspirations of what we call the donut portrait. But of course, we know that every city is part of a larger whole. So how can our city respect the health of the whole planet? How do the food or the clothing or the electronics uh, that are consumed within a city generate environmental burdens, both at home, but also abroad? And what would our pressure on the planet be if, if everyone on the planet consumed resources and emitted waste in this way? And finally, how can our city respect the well-being of people worldwide? So again, think of the food or the clothing or the electronics flowing through a city. And except now think of the people who grew the food or who stitched the clothes or who mined and assembled and shipped and delivered the products. What are their labor conditions and how do global supply chains that connect your place to them affect their communities and their working conditions. So these are the, the questions that we offer to ambitious cities and regions, and we know it's complex, but we believe that they underpin just so many of the challenges and opportunities that we are facing in the 21st century. And what we found is that in workshops with city policymakers in Amsterdam and in Brussels and Portland and other places is that sitting down in front of each city portrait was actually really empowering because each person could see their issue or their sector, but you see it in the context of a greater whole and you can start to draw new connections and see synergies or challenges or possibilities that weren't visible when the city was working in a more siloed way. And here's just a quick example of what it could look like from a workshop we recently gave in Toronto that was looking at food systems as an example of a particular sector of looking through the four lenses. So we could do the same thing for energy or mobility or housing or for the city as a whole. And blue sticky notes are like the idea of targets and yellow sticky notes give a snapshot of city performance. That's really an important part of the donuts. You're always comparing relative to where you want to be. And you can see that the local lenses have a lot more data, which makes sense because that's where city planners focus and their jurisdictions often lie. But we think that, you know, when it comes to the global lenses, seeing those gaps is really important because a current lack of targets doesn't mean that you can just ignore global responsibilities. So here's a few of the sticky notes that are zoomed in, which I'll leave you to read, but you get a sense that the specific metrics that we bring only give like a blurred snapshot of people's lived experience. Uh, but that's just, we try to use it really not as a quantitative approach. It's really just meant to be a starting point because the objective is to find entryways to transformative action, to identify opportunities and targets and their interconnections and possibilities for action. So we brought this board to a workshop, the mirror board, and this is where we start laying out the opportunities and challenges and interconnections. And we find that it's a useful holistic tool. So that's one of the tools that I wanted to share with you all. And then the other one is what we call the deep design of cities. And this came from work in Amsterdam where we showed the portrait, they built one, but they said, okay, we see these holistic viewpoints with the different lenses, global, ecological aspirations, responsibilities, but how, we're not designed in order to address that. So they reached out to Kate and she worked together with the, uh, well, she developed a framework really to, that looks at how can we transition? How can we pivot from the 20th century goal, which is really about how can we make our city grow towards this vision of how can we make our city thrive in balance? And it's really based on these five core design traits around purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance. And they actually get deeper in terms of the institutional design trait of them as the deeper you go down. Um, I'm happy to give any examples, but just for the purposes of time, I wanted to present that and then illustrate very quickly another type of canvas that we're developing to start answering that question of what's drawing us back if we want to move away from an ex extractive economy and what's driving us forward in terms of a regenerative and distributive economy. And we, of course, every time we talk to cities or places, it doesn't matter what scale you're at, you're always constrained. So immediately we, we want to acknowledge that you only have powers to act at a certain level. There are cities, but then maybe you don't have influence over a province or over the nation or internationally, but let's acknowledge that. And let's see if we can start mapping on things that we can, can uh, do across each of those design traits and across each of those scales. And when you do so, 
then maybe if you're working at a level of a city, you can identify things that, hey, what? here's some initiatives that we can actually just stop doing right now. Um, and here's some initiatives that we could start doing to take us where we want to go. And of course, here's some other initiatives where we need to work with others in alliances like the Climate Caucus or uh, other progressive alliances to achieve where we want to be or to extract ourselves from, from alliances that are not moving us to the, the goal that we want to be. So that is what I wanted to share in terms of tools. Amsterdam has been a pioneer in terms of adapting these approaches. Uh, they published their report in April of 2020 and just kicked off what we see as a as just a as a period of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration that has been incredibly inspiring and we believe also incredibly powerful that it might actually be able to achieve the type of rapid change that we need to to achieve. So Amsterdam, they set themselves a really core goal. Brussels picked up very shortly after they've identified this beautiful four lens portrait uh, using the methodology that I presented earlier. We've been working with, well, Cornwall, they've essentially been doing it themselves, have developed a decision-making wheel to almost instead of replacing the concept of cost-benefit analysis with looking at how projects will affect the donut through different dimensions. And of course, Nanaimo, who has adopted donut economics as part of a council decision, which I'm delighted to share the stage with, with Councillor Tyler Brown, who will be following. So I'll leave it there and looking forward to anything else. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andrew. That was really interesting. I really liked how you were able to roll out the donut and give that, that four um, lens framework. That was really helpful. So next, we're going to dive down a bit and see how the donut framework is used in Nanaimo. Over to you, Tyler. Thank you and good morning, everyone. And thank you, Andrew, for showing that last slide as a, a last minute substitute here for uh, Ben Gesselbrock. And of course, my keyboard isn't working this morning, so I can't open my slides. So, uh, but uh, I wear my notes, but uh, I'm okay with that. So I am coming to you from the traditional territory of the Sanaas and Sanaim of First People on the Vancouver Islands. And I'm coming from my home office, and I want to highlight that because there's, I can hear some toddlers destroying the room beside me, and you may hear that too. So uh, if you hear some screaming and whatnot, that's what that is. So I think, uh, you know, what you touched upon there, Andrew, sets the stage nicely because uh, as someone that's worked in local government for a long time, and but more recently in the last municipal election, was elected to council and ultimately appointed to the regional district board. Um, you know, it's, it's very apparent that uh, municipalities are on the front lines of a lot of these issues. Um, I think sometimes we want to point to other levels of government as one, uh, solving them. Um, and there, there's a certain truth to that, but ultimately uh, on many different topics uh, or many different items, there's uh, sort of uh, overlap of uh, jurisdiction and how they handle it. And, and municipalities are crucial to responding to uh, social challenges and also some of uh, these greater climate challenges. So early in uh, my term, uh, our council struck an environmental committee that many cities have. Uh, we didn't have one at, at the present time. And uh, Council Ben Gesselbrock and I uh, were the co-chairs of the group of citizens and supported by staff. To be very honest, the, the initial meetings were very, very aimless. And you could sense frustration growing in the room by, you know, those on the committee, uh, you know, staff trying to support it, and, uh, and uh, Ben and myself. And it was only about the fourth or fifth meeting where, where an older citizen on the, uh, uh, the committee um, with loads of experience in different things with uh, engineering and local government suggested that, hey, what we really lacked was a framework that showed how everything came together. And at that point, we were really talking about the different uh, environmental issues that the city was embarking on. Um, or had embarked on. And, and so staff staff went to work and they put together a framework. But as that conversation was happening, um, our city was also, like many cities uh, in British Columbia and across the province, grappling with huge social challenges from those uh, those that are unfortunately living on the streets and the impact uh, of the opiate crisis uh, and homelessness and, and what was happening on the community. And Again, it started to become very clear that the city was doing doing different things, but it was it, it lacked uh, it lacked any sort of coordination or interconnectedness. And 
So as we were having this conversation around the framework for the environment community, we started to ask ourselves, well, do we need frameworks for other things to sort of stitch it all together? And we pondered this issue and the idea really started to emerge is that what we are doing as a city is, is broad. We deal with a lot of different items. Uh, we're expected to respond to a lot of different items. And we have a lot of ongoing initiatives, but there was no clear uh, connection between any of them and no clear way to prioritize or uh, identify things that existed at the intersection of multiple problems. And so we started to ask some, some I think, some important questions, but simple questions. And what we're really trying to do is sort of get to the, the first principles of the matter. You know, questions as simple as what was the overall vision for the city? What goal was it pointed at? Whose goal was it? Whose vision was it? Uh, what were the overarching values that, uh, that were holding this together? How did different city initiatives come together? And which plan or vision tied it together? And in retrospect, I think what we were, we were really searching for was coherence. And there's a definition uh, that I like uh, from Jonathan P. Rose in his book, The Well-Tempered City. And he says, just as an equalizing tuning system committed 24 different musical scales to integrate and to influence one another for the first time. So cities need a framework to unify their many disparate pro programs, departments, and aspirations. When a community has a vision and a plan for how to carry it out and is able to coherently integrate its disparate elements, then it begins to be well-tempered. Coherence is essential for cities to thrive. And I think we all have experience of that when we talk about, oh, the different silos of a city or an organization um, and, and some of those challenges. And so as we, as we answered those questions that I touched upon, uh, it became very clear that only one framework satisfied what we were looking for. And what we were looking for really was a vision, a mission-oriented approach, and the ability to guide policy and decision-making in one model, a framework that linked eco-justice with social justice to drive and track transformative action and change. And the reason we were looking for that is because that's the only way we can respond to these 21st century problems. They are massive problems, and I don't think that can be uh, understated or downplayed. And they're, you know, I think Andrew touched upon it, they, they are the result of uh, sort of modes of being and modes of operating from the last century. Um, and, and they may have served a purpose at one point, um, but that, that purpose now, are, or there's new challenges and new problems that, that may have come from that or may have never been solved by it, and there's a reckoning. Uh, so, you know, inspired what Amsterdam was doing and the research into uh, uh, Kate and what Theo were doing, uh, we brought the donut, uh, Ben and I brought it towards uh, to council, and it barely passed. It passed 5 4, and uh, there's some interesting discussion there, and I don't have time to get into that, but, uh, but ultimately it passed. And it wasn't just, uh, you know, Learning from what we had done before, we had sort of passed the climate emergency uh, declaration and we had some, some actions. And unfortunately, I wouldn't say that necessarily trans, you know, I look at what places like Vancouver and how that translated into, you know, not perfectly, but, you know, some, some real meaningful action. Uh, we didn't see that same sort of uh, action here. So uh, we tried to be very more, far more specific in what our expectation was. Uh, and we set this as a the guiding framework and principles for all city initiatives and projects. Most importantly, an existing OCP review that was uh, uh, currently underway. That OCP review um, also now includes, or, and includes far more things. Uh, so we're doing it you know, an economic development strategy, an active transportation master plan, a, a water, uh, a water uh, supply strategy, parks and recreation master plan, a health and housing plan, all that will be guided now and linked together by the donut. Um, and, you know, it's a natural fit. We've now tried to you know, move that more into concrete actions as well, not waiting for that planning exercise to be done. And I think that's where I was really inspired by Vancouver and the climate emergency declaration was that they didn't wait to, to develop another plan. They said, okay, we know we need to figure out some more stuff, but in the meantime, we're going to uh, accelerate a bunch of items. So that's what we're really trying to do is not necessarily wait for those planning documents to be complete. It's an ongoing exercise. and It will be the biggest engagement uh, exercise in the Nimo's history with businesses and citizens and different groups. Um, but, you know, we're, we've adopted sustainable procurement with quite ambitious goals and infusing that into the organization. We're seeking to disinvest from fossil fuels. Uh, 
And while staff implement this work, you know, ongoing conversations with council and members of the community, it's like, what's next? How do we take this even further? We can't wait. We have to respond to these social and eco ecological challenges that we're facing. Uh, so I want to touch upon what I think some next steps are, and these will be really driven by my personal viewpoint here. Um, but one thing I just want to highlight is because often people will say, well, there's lots of existing, existing frameworks. Why didn't you uh, go with those? And I think they're very well intentioned, but some of them might be misguided or they don't necessarily fit to the problems that we're facing. And in my experience, city governments often adopt sort of two frameworks for decision making, you know, off triple line, triple bottom line accounting and the three parts of sustainability. And I don't necessarily think these are bad frameworks, but what I think they miss out is, is they tend to treat or they get interpreted as treating economic value as an ends of itself. And I contrast that with the donut. I think this is really crucial where the donut has that social foundation based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals as the inner edge and the ecological uh, planetary boundaries as the outer edge. Economics then becomes the means in which you achieve those social, and it's, you know, it's not the separate category that you're aiming for. It is, it is how you operate within that green section of the donut that uh, uh, Andrew uh, highlighted earlier. And economics then is the activity that provides uh, for the social foundations while we well, it's you know, critical that it stays within the capacity of the planet. So economics is a means, not an end. And I think that's centered rightly in the donut model, where sometimes it gets lost in those other models. So where does Nanaimo go for next? I'll try to be quick here, really cognizant of time. Uh, what Amsterdam, you know, we learned about what Amsterdam is doing is they're infusing it and they're completely reorienting and reforming their organization to, uh, to basically be you know, donut driven. Uh, the organization will follow that strategic goal and, uh, and those values. That's, you know, ultimately we need to, we need to silo bus to get there. Uh, you know, I don't want to see a single staff report which doesn't have a, a section on the donut about how, uh, you know, what areas are being met, what might be being compromised on so, uh, so council can make those trade-offs and decision-making. Our annual business planning and capital planning needs to incorporate donut thinking provide for our citizens while respecting that ecological ceiling. You know, right now we're still, you know, spending millions of dollars on asphalt and creating new rules and all those sort of things. And I would argue that if we were applying donut thinking, we would be doing those things fundamentally differently or maybe not doing them at all. Uh, a lot of great work from out of Baltimore on outcome-based budgeting. You know, what does it what does it mean to have outcomes built into your budget so you're accounting for every single dollar spent to meet your strategic goals? Uh, so we need to be doing that on our in our annual budgeting, but I'd argue we need to be thinking, you know, local governments and brewers coming have to adopt five year financial plans. Uh, we don't have any donut thinking in there. We need to go beyond five years, 10 years plus. Uh, we need to be thinking on a time frame to see beyond sort of political cycles to see uh, the implementation of, of this thinking over the long term. Uh, because ultimately a true a community's true vision isn't in its OCP or anything else, it's in the budget. You know, that's where that's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, we're we're already starting on this work, but we need to build uh, community-based coalitions to uh, see businesses, to see social agencies, to to find alignment. Uh, you know, we have uh, thankfully uh, a mayor's task force uh, with a subcommittee on this that has has some, you know, head of the chambers on it, um, uh, social agent heads of social agencies are on it to to start to see. What is the synergies there with the city? How can we support them? How can they support us? And ultimately, how can this uh, this grow into a, a more a nebulous network to see it actually across the city? Uh, and finally, uh, I think we need to ultimately, you know, cities have some powers or existing powers, and we need to you know, borrow some language a little bit from Seth Klein. Uh, we need to create new economic institutions at the local level to better respond to these social environmental challenges. I got some ideas. I know others got some ideas, uh, um, but I won't get into here. So I, I just want to finish on sort of what's standing in our way or what are some of the challenges that we face. So we are embarking on this. Uh, we're doing our best within the existing paradigm and it ultimately is a culture shift. And I think the biggest thing that I find that, you know, myself or you know others that I work with it, uh, in government is often we lack imagination. And, and there's sort of a line that I like that a government that lacks imagination will find it more difficult to create public value. And I couldn't think, I don't, I don't think, I think that is so, so true. Because I, my experience in government is we often sell uh, or sell ourselves short 
we limit what we believe we can be and we fall upon sort of common conceptions of what we are as local government, you know, local governments or governments in general. A city government is about filling potholes. The city government is about toilets that flush. These are completely false. Uh, we are those things, but we're so much more. And in cities, the idea and notions of cities predates the provincial or federal or national state. They, they exist because there's this belief that they aim at a good uh, that uh, we can't achieve alone. And I don't think, you know, I think that might be a little philosophical, but I think it's fundamentally uh, crucial to how we're going to orient ourselves to believing that we can solve these uh, 21st century problems. Um, and Tyler, I'm going to stop you there because that's, I'm going to get you to end at that very inspiring um, note to say that to, to be imaginative and innovative, and, and that is the role of local government. So that's excellent. Um, sure. We would love to dive into some more implementation stuff with you and hopefully we'll have some time during the questions, but I want to make sure we have time for Alex to to talk and then some time for questions and answers and there's already questions to you Tyler in the Q and a. Um, if you are able to answer some of them online that would be great as we're going along over to you Alex who's going to talk big picture. Thank you. Um, gee, can I see if i'm sharing my screen not yet probably sharing with myself very helpful <laughs> not the idea um is that now yep that's good my screen yep great okay thank you for inviting me i think it's interesting to say big picture because we've had quite a a good couple of sections that do, do cover big picture, but thank you for inviting me. I'm thankful to be working and playing and loving on the unceded traditional territory of Squamish Nation and Little Watt Nation. Um, great to follow Andrew and Taylor bringing to life both the conceptual framework, but uh, a real case of implementation of system change. I'm now going to invite you to take a step back to think of systems change more broadly. It's a bit of a challenge on Zoom. Uh, for me as well, as he went to mention on this opening, um, I, I feel that um, you can tell probably from the map behind me that I'm used to being in workshops where people stand around like Andrew was describing as well, around a map where they can point at things and when they can recognize themselves on it and having the energy in the room is a very different thing. So I can't smell those leaves that he went and was showing there. Uh, but we'll do our best and I'll be looking forward to the to the Q&A. Um, so first, why, why we want to talk about system change. Andrew's first slide already started us off with a clear picture of the many challenges that we're facing today. Clearly, these problems are complex, can't be solved in silos within departments. Problems are inter intertwined with each other. Fixing one thing causes issues elsewhere uh, to pop up. And... Uh, it's all part of a network built over hundreds of years to create the systems we operate in. And in some cases, systems are fiercely defended. Um, so again, reinforcing what Andrew uh, mentioned about long established systems, think about Adam Smith, founder of still called modern economics, who created the concept of GDP. He lived in the 1700s. We talk about truth and reconciliation here in Canada, problems that arise from 1500s colonialism. So who would guess that the building here is Wall Street, built in mid 1800s for today's markets? So it's no surprise we want system change, whether broken or outdated, they no longer deliver the outcome intended, or if they do, the outcomes are unsustainable. But what does it actually mean? With all the talk about needing system change, and you'll be surprised to hear how often we get the question, what's the difference between change and system change? So we find that it can be helpful to spend a couple of minutes aligning on what that basic concept is. So the way we like to talk about this is what's a system, put it simply, a system is a series of elements interconnected, but they're not randomly interconnected. So this is where we come with purpose and uh, they're connected for a purpose. So systems bring together people with deep seated values, with mindsets, worldviews, and that's what defines the purpose of the system. We, they create the rules, formal, informal rules, mechanisms of governance, like Andrew was referring to on that, um, on that part of the, at the end of the, the, the slides that you had, Andrew. 
So the process activities, flows of information, flows of capital, that whole network, all sorts of tangible and intangible elements that come together to create outcomes in principle aligned with that purpose. And now I go into the to Tyler's point about should ring a bell about coherence. So in principle, they are coherent. But as systems develop, they grow in complexity, but also they grow in power. So they can deliver many more outcomes. Think of our economic system, right, with its sophisticated interconnections and how it delivers so many outcomes across the board. But it comes with a price. Subsystems are created and quickly they take a life of their own. They become complex in themselves. They become the realm of individuals and take a life of their own. So all of a sudden you have lots of purposes and systems get distracted. Accountabilities become fuzzy, roles and responsibilities, jurisdictions uh, get blurred, day-to-day -day management, um, resource allocation, decision-making in general becomes very challenging. Unintended consequences begin to surface externalities that were not accounted for when those systems were designed become visible. And before we know it, we spend more time dealing with these unintended consequences than enjoying the purpose of the system itself. I, I think we all recognize some of that in our day to day. So at this point, we begin to say, we need course correction. Where is the North Star? We need system change. And the other thing is, it's why is it that we're talking about so much now? So there's overwhelming scientific evidence that we're living through unprecedented times. So I'm, I'm very tempted to stand up here, but it probably will waste time. But there is a confluence of crises, health, social, climate, economical, and it's also clearly connected. Sheen talked about it right at the start and, and Andrew and, and Tyler. So we need to deal with these crises head on. Evidence indicates that those interconnections are creating dynamics currently taking us in the wrong direction. We all heard of climate shifting points. But there's an opening in the clouds. COVID um, has brought that, if anything good, to come out. A lot of efforts and attention to build back way better. But we're not out of the woods. I think it's the expression, not off the hook yet. Uh, we need to take a leadership stance. And how do we do that? What do we have to do for that? The issues we're dealing with, whether it's COVID, whether it's fire, whether it's um, social injustice, economic recovery post-COVID, they are all complex. And to address them, we need to be thinking systemically, how we change those relationships that, um, that we recognize. So there's, one, there's no one right way to do it. We, we, in our system work, we get a lot of people asking, is there a way to map where there is a button there, where there's a knob in the system that we can intervene, that it will change the whole thing? And it's the famous uh, look for a, a silver bullet. There is no such thing. The one thing we need to embrace is the complexity and start making systems thinking second nature. All of the things that Andrew and Tyler were talking, it's systems thinking. We just don't need to be talking that language of systems thinking. But it, it's, it's just part of how we, how we work, how we make decisions, how we go about. There are university courses on how to learn to think systemically. What we encourage you to do, it's simply hone these three skills, right? It's think wider, think deeper, and think further. And I'm going to go to very quickly with them. I could spend an hour. Some people could spend days on this, but um, we want to. I'm very happy to pick up afterwards. I'm famous for speaking fast. So thinking wider, we are talking about stepping back from your problems to see the full picture, bring people into the conversation, include their perspectives. It will make you 10 times better. All the examples we heard is about engaging community. Tyler talked about the biggest engagement approach in Nanaimo. So that's the one, the first one. Think deeper. We need to dive in to understand what drives the outcomes that we're dealing with. We need to master that network of connections. Much of the complexity is hidden when we spend our day to day trying to change what we see, what's above the surface and keep missing the strong underlying structure, the structure that goes um, under the water. And it's actually all the way to the mindsets. And that's the mindset that drives the system from its core, that determines the purpose in the first place. So acting at the system's um, level, it's reactive, most likely to require rework. It's by going all the way down 
to the bottom that we find leverage. It might feel difficult and even scary sometimes to stay under the water. Untangling issues of truth from the 1500s, not going to be easy, but dealing with symptoms will not bring reconciliation. Questioning GDP growth in laissez-faire economics seems radical, but quite appropriate if you consider they are rooted in 300-year-old concept, right? So when we do resolve the issues at their root, it's rewarding. There is leverage, things move. Moving from this is how it's always been, this is how it's always going to be, to what if we do this and why not do that feels great. So, and, and the third, third skill there, there is really about thinking further. Take your time with others to work out cause and effect relationships so that solutions that you are creating are long lasting. They won't backfire. You also find that your impact goes way beyond what you think. It's not just your direct remit. There is a long way that you can um, create um, change there. Now, there's lots of concepts, approaches, and tools. The great news there. Um, concepts like the triple bottom line, mission economy, SDGs, donut economics, at their highest level, they're all about keeping a check on the purpose of the system. Now, each of these concepts get translated into more practical implementation, and, and, and Tyler was absolutely right that not all translations work smoothly, but actually John Elkington will be the first one to recognize he recalled his own concept because in his own words, this triple bottom line wasn't designed to be an accounting tool. It was intended to provoke deeper thinking about capitalism and future. So the idea of revisiting capitalism is still making amazing strides. We are super proud of work we've done with uh, over the last 10 years, started with John Elkington, and now a uh, system, financial system app is being used in COP next week. SDGs have been adopted in many ways, including here in Canada, vital signs, vital cafes, Donut economics, as we've seen today, is evolving with new tools being made available as it gets traction. We have um, created a, actually a, a system map for the donut economics that is, is pretty much what um, Andrew described as unrolling. But I, I was going to save this. I was going to show this 30 seconds film, but I can show another time to make sure that we keep uh, moving. But uh, there's a lot of momentum gathering at a global level. So we've got um, this decade being referred to as the most consequential for humanity. We never heard these words in, in the past. So the Race to Zero has mobilized a coalition of thousands of organizations. Glasgow Financial Alliance is bringing together 160 firms with 70 trillion in assets to join forces to the, to the global economy. So the momentum is here. We need to make sure we join forces. Cities' positions bringing closer to our context, unique leadership role that cities have becomes clear. Cities are at the center between top-down uniform regulation and government governance and, um, and individuals and community groups concerned but fragmented. In the middle, we have cities in the right systemic level as a connector. Tyler talked about the power of creativity. Cities have a relative autonomy and agility to experiment. Cities can then manage up to shape the additional um, changes that can be happening. Cities of all sizes have the critical role as this engine of innovation. So- Alex, I'm gonna get you to, to wrap. Soon. Yep, wrapping up now. Your role in your system. So more important than approaches and tools is to have a systems thinking mindset. We need courage and ambition to drive the transformation at the scale we need. We need to be determined to affect what we can affect, expand the sphere of influence, our own cause and effect change reaction, and with that, the impact in the system. It's hard to ask deep questions. It's hard to consider many more interconnections, but it's way easier to say that's how things are. But my hope is that you as a leader can adopt a not on my watch attitude and take a role as the master of your own system. So thank you. I hope it has been useful to help you find leverage and appreciate it was a lot. So uh, get in touch. Thank you very much, Alex. That was big picture systems thinking and everything. Um, th this was really amazing, and I was trying to get some, write down some key nuggets, but there were way too many, but just a, a couple, don't leave anyone in the hole. I think that's a really concrete way of thinking about the donut, but also about how we use the donut. 
think wider, think deeper, think further. I really love that. So that we're not just focusing on issues at hand without thinking about what happened in the past and what's gonna happen in the future. And I loved Tyler's words about role of local government and inspiring and how Nanaimo is actually using this. And you're so right that there's so many frameworks out there. How do you decide which is the, the best one? Um, what I like about the donut economic framework is that it's a framework, but it's concrete enough that can, re like when Andrew rolled it out the donut and showed that quadrant, it really showed how to use it and how it links to this the sustainable development, um, uh, the, the UN goals for sustainable development. So it, it makes those goals much more concrete, especially for communities and local government. And it was just so great to see how Tyler's actually using it in a municipality. Um, so it, I'm assuming it was the city not yet, not yet in the regional district, right? <laughs> and it's really inspiring to hear that you're doing a lot of public engagement around it. So um, we're, we've got about 15, 10-ish, 12-ish minutes for questions. There's some questions already. So there's a few questions directed to you, uh, specifically Tyler. So if you could look at the Q&A and if you could address some of those um, just by typing them. But what, what I'm going to ask um, you guys are sort of, my first question is a combination of my question and questions from, from the um, from the audience. And since I'm wearing the head ornament, I get to ask my questions first. So it's about applying the, the concept of donut economics. And I'm think, I'm sure you guys really inspired people to really think about how to use this, but um, I'm going to direct this to all, well, maybe I'll direct it to Tyler first and then get you got others to, to answer other questions. Um, so Tyler, it seems like you guys, you, you were able to pass it through council, but what do you say, what would you say are the first steps to start integrating? You'd mentioned using in the OCP and other planning documents, but what, what advice would you give to local governments to use, what are the first steps for local governments to start using the donut economics framework and applying it to their way of doing work? Great, great question. So I think, that, you know, you have to engage with it as a council and, and as a staffing body. And, you know, in retrospect, I wish we had given ourselves a little more time for that engagement process to make that conversation go uh, a little smoother. Um, but I think the biggest thing I would say is if you want to adopt it is not feel like you have to have it all figured out. Uh, just start where you're at and start chipping it away at it because um, and I, th I think systems thinking as a whole is not a commonplace. Uh, it's not co as commonplace as it should be in, in, in local governments and governments as a whole. And uh, I think the, the, the hardest part is just simply starting. And you know that, that was some great advice the deal folks um, had given us as we started moving along was you don't have to do a radical revisit everything all at once. Just start where you're at and, and, and then you'll find the momentum builds. And, and you know if you're starting on something new, uh, there's gonna be things that you do that don't work. And so you can't be afraid of the failure as well. You just have to, to go for it. That's, that's really, I think, as simple as it is because most organizations have great staffing bodies and all those sort of things that just need to be given a vision and they will figure out the details. It's not council's job or it's not an elected body's job to necessarily figure out all the details. Oh, it's not? <laughs> Thank you no. for that. Just, just go for it. Um, I'm reading Barack Obama's book, so yes, we can. That's excellent. Um, I'm going to ask separate questions. So, Andrew, how, um, in your experience, what, what have you seen are some of the first steps for getting local governments to jump into adopting the donut economics framework? That's great. I, I can, certainly can't point to a single answer. It's really, really what my experience has shown over the past time. Mean, I've been with Deal for, for, you know, a bit more than a year and a half. And what I've seen is that there's really just entry points everywhere. Uh, it could be from communities, uh, change makers, from progressive counselors, from academics who want to, who have approached the, 
the Council for Funding in order to create a portrait. In the case of Barcelona, the progressive councillors in Nanaimo, of course, but also in Copenhagen. In Amsterdam, it was more of a, uh, it was actually both. It was really from the council, really the council themselves, but as well um, being involved in the C40 Cities Alliance, which is an alliance of 96 of the world's kind of most climate ambitious cities uh, to bring together the idea. So what we've found at Deal is really that we have a principle similar to what Tyler just communicated is of go where the energy is. And so that's what we do in all of our work, really. We, we really, we don't push the donut at all, actually. We're the first ones to put up our hands and say, you know what, there's the SDGs, there's a triple bottom line, there's the donut, all those frameworks that we saw, that's great. If that's working for you, go for it. If we're achieving change that towards the shared goal that we need, you don't need to use the word donut. You don't need to use, like, we're all in the same space that we see ourselves at least. Uh, so another principle for us is don't be the movement, join the movement, which is similar to Alexandra's, uh, you know, we're, we're a network, we're a system, we're nodes within it. And so we try to just go where the energy is. Essentially, what we when we do engage, it's virtually always by invitation because that's an important part of that principle of going where the energy is. I recognize in cities that can't always be the case though, because you know you can. That's where the real action happens. And to that, uh, essentially, what we can, the way we work is in the space of almost like paradigms and narratives as well as connecting and making visible change makers at uh, the community level. And as well, we work with people who are working within the system, who are almost often invisible, but working to create that, that system change, find that leverage that Alexandra just said. And, and uh, we, if we are invited, we just take their lead and support any way that we can. So that's... Great, thank you. So um, em embrace the systems change without being too prescriptive. And I, I think that's really important. Um, yet, I think there needs to be some guidance. So that's why I like the donut economics model because it does give that level of guidance. So it's not open to interpretation. Sustainability isn't really open to interpretation. There's a science-based principle principles on what sustainability is and the ecological limits and what society and needs for a healthy for, for a healthy community. So um, there's that balance. Uh, there's a ton of questions on chat and, and Q and A and stuff. Alexandra, uh, people were asking about how do you apply the systems lens or systems thinking approach better, especially when the, and everybody on, on this webinar is very focused on climate action. So municipalities have declared climate emergencies, they've got climate action plans uh, ready to go, some are more ahead than others in, in terms of implementation. How do you use a systems approach to move forward climate action and also getting everybody on board? <laughs> Small oh, question. And I have one minute, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Well, yeah. Um, I think I think it obviously depends very much on on what the context is, what the specific challenges are. But I I would probably start with that. What what's most relevant for that context, and that are that tends to be either um, big ticket items, big problems that they might have. That if you pick one and work through it, so say housing, yeah, um, the most problematic issue we find here this week, because we know it changes every week, they're all big, uh, pick one and start unpacking it, because very quickly you start seeing that network of connections. And the more you can engage people in those conversations, you will naturally start forming um, a collective view of that problem that so shows, well, housing actually is connected to infrastructure which is connected to the natural environment team that is working on preserving those areas that are now um, up for grabs for new development so find what is it that um, might be the challenge of the day and start working through it with conversation if you're not using donuts as a reference it's a conversation that says what are we trying to achieve in this uh, housing challenge how are we going to solve it if we keep in mind that whether you use the donut words or not, if we keep in mind that what we're trying to do is create a thriving community, what we're trying to do is help the people here um, be happy, be healthy. Um, uh, yeah, 
Does that um, answer Jean for now? I know it was a hard question to answer. Yes, that was very helpful. Thank you. And as, as I mentioned, there's quite a few questions on the Q&A. So if I could get you guys, Tyler, Alex, and Andrew to look at the questions and answer them, because we do need to have a break and I need to turn it over to Alex Lidstone for some um, instructions for the afternoon. I, about two chats ago, before David's question or David's comment, specific challenge is getting climate champions elected. And I remember us having a specific um, session on that in a previous climate caucus meeting or gathering. So uh, yes, that is a very specific challenge. But anyway, before that chat, I sent a link. And if you Google donut economics, there's all kinds of resources, um, including the resources from Kate, um, Kate who started the whole donut economics yeah. concept. Uh, but I sent a link to that website and it's got some really great uh, visuals and information. And in fact, I'll share one of them with you right now. I think I would just add again, Chin, to, to, to these challenges is, is both finding what is paralyzing people because there are people who are paralyzed for lack of awareness, um, just overwhelming um, by all of these issues around them. But in some cases, there are pressure from other forces as well. So how do you help them remove that pressure or at least counter that pressure? Um, so it's, it's acknowledging those things as well. That's why some might have noticed the leverage on, on the slides that we have. There is a Goliath at the bottom of that lever, which is counter forces. And there's a lot of Davids like all of us here that are trying to do um, a lot and doing together with the coherence that, that Tyler was talking about is how you manage to push back on forces, but you need to recognize those forces as well. Thanks, Alex. And uh, Laura just sent a link to Kate Raworth, that, that's her last name, book on donut economics. It's on, um, on the chat. And so what I've just posted, put on the on my screen is again, the donut. Um, and I, when we go into our breakout rooms this afternoon, I want us to keep the donut in mind when we're talking about dream, um, design, deliver. So remember, we don't want anyone left in the hole and we wanna work within the donut, within the ecological ceiling and make sure we support a strong social foundation. So with that, I want to say thank you to our three panelists, Andrew, Tyler, and Alexandra. That was a really, really thought provoking, great start to the day. Um, and yes, please be, please take a chance, take a minute to answer all those questions. There's lots of questions. People are really interested in, in this topic. So thank you very much for that. And I will see people this afternoon when we walk around Gathertown. Over to you, Alex L. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful panel. Thank you, all of my dreams coming true. Um, <laughs> and so I will just quickly go over some of our, our quick uh, housekeeping bits before we get going. So everyone just hang on a second. Um, so the first thing I'd like to say is I want to remind everyone that we do have community guidelines for today. Um, so please refer to the rules. And if you see problematic behavior, you can either contact me or um, any of the other organizers. Um, so anyone that says sort of help desk on, on uh, Gather Town or um, any of the other folks who are sort of on the steering committee. And we ask that everyone just be respectful and considerate um, during all of the presentations and breakout sessions. And I'll drop the guidelines once again here in the chat. Um, also, so after this, we are moving over to Gather Town. So I will drop the link in the chat here. Um, also, for any folks who had a hard time finding links, um, in your links email that was sent out from, from the ticket uh, company, um, there should be an attachment that says Summit Links. Um, so there's the three separate ones, the one for this webinar this morning, one for Gather Town, and then one for the webinar in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, just maybe um, you can go to those, but we'll all maybe send around another link um, after this, but the Gather Town link is there in the chat for you um, right now. So when you open Gather Town, please just take a moment to make a character that actually looks like you. Um, you can use your name and your pronouns. We encourage pronouns. Um, and you can go through the little tutorial if you like. Um, so 
Um, if you're unfamiliar with the platform, you, we do have a short break right now, so you can go check it out when this is over. Um, there, there's going to be two breakout sessions on there. So we're giving everybody the liberty to choose your own breakout room. Okay, so the breakouts will be in the rooms labeled breakout. There's six of them all together, and we're hoping to have around 10 to 15 people in a breakout room. So you can see the how many people are in the room um so please don't all overcrowd one room we have six amazing facilitators you're going to be doing the same thing in all of them so please spread yourselves out and i know that we have a nice spooky halloween room um so not everyone's allowed to rush to that one okay um so it should be great um and essentially after this uh you're, you're all going to have a wonderful time no matter which room you pick um so after this, then we're going to be coming back for afternoon sessions, um, beginning at about, I think, 1245. Uh Pacific time. So I'll make sure that everybody has links and stuff like that. If you have any issues, um, you know, you can go to someone that has help desk on Gathertown and we have about a 10 minute break right now. So we'll be starting breakouts at uh, 1035 Pacific. Um, so you can have a little break. And if you haven't been on Gathertown, you can go on there. And I believe that is everything I need to tell you.